Hello again. Uh, I am Dr. Ron Trailer, and this is History 321, and this is lecture number 16. All right. When we stopped uh, the last lecture, we were uh, beginning to discuss the life and times of Huey Long. Uh, and we're going to pick up uh, with that same topic and then go forward with that. <clears throat> Long decided that he wanted to go into state politics. And being the shrewd person that he was, he did his homework. And he discovered that he was really not eligible because he was too young. He was not eligible for most statewide offices. But uh, there was an exception. And that was the, uh, what, at the, what at that time was called the Louisiana State Railroad Commission, uh, which later changed its name to the Louisiana Public Service Commission. Uh, there was an opening on the commission, and there were no age requirements at all. So, uh, since age was not a, an issue, Long decides to run or a seat on the Louisiana State Railroad Commission. Now, what was uh, the Louisiana State Railroad Commission? Well, it, it was not just about railroads. Uh, for example, uh, it had jurisdiction over natural gas pipelines that were becoming more and more and more common uh, in Louisiana. Um, this was in 1918, by the way. So World War I had just ended. Uh, the Louisiana State Railroad Commission also had jurisdiction of the laws concerning oil pipelines, river boats, public utilities. The commission did very little. Um, it was very ineffective. Political leaders had little interest in meaningful regulations uh, <clears throat> or, for that matter, uh, the taxation of business. So Long realized that the commission had potential power and would give him statewide exposure. With no minimum age for qualifying, uh, the 25-year-old Long ran for his first public office, and he campaigned statewide. He traveled extensively by automobile, uh, which was quite an accomplishment considering uh, the backward condition of roads in Louisiana at the time. Uh, he operated on a shoestring. Uh, he stayed quite often. He would stay in the homes of friends. Uh, that he had made, the uh, friendships that he had made back in his traveling salesman days. He finished second in the primary. Uh, and in the runoff, he won a narrow victory. So here he is, 25 years old, and he is now a member of the Louisiana State Railroad Commission. And he worked hard for his constituents. Unlike past members of the commission, who probably just cashed their check periodically, and that's about all they did, Long uh, worked hard for the people of Louisiana. Uh, he supported lower utility rates. Um, he wanted to lower riverboat and railroad ticket prices. Uh, he wanted to create more pipelines for natural gas. He defended the small oil companies against the larger ones. So, Long serves on the Railroad Commission. And in 1924, um, he decides that he is going to run for the governorship of the state of Louisiana. He was just barely 30 years old, which means that he just barely met the age qualification. Because unlike 
the Railroad Commission, uh, the governor did have a minimum age requirement. He was just barely qualified. He had no money. He had no statewide political organization to speak of. He was, a not, he was not one of the political elites of the state. And he certainly was not a member of that, uh, that elite political structure. Now, on top of that, he had made many business leaders and many political leaders angry because of his work on the Public Service Commission. As a matter of fact, when he runs for the governorship, he runs against two members of the old political establishment, what we've been calling the Bourbons all along, right? One of them had the backing of the of the uh, of the political leaders of New Orleans, and we've talked about how important it was uh, in order to win. To win statewide election in Louisiana, you had to have, you had to carry the city of New Orleans. Well, he sort of did not get that support. Somebody else got that support. Uh, the other uh, of the of his two opponents uh, was the incumbent lieutenant governor, and he had the endorsement of the outgoing governor. And he had the support from uh, South and Southwest Louisiana, what we quite often call Acadiana, uh, the Cajun part of the state. Now, those two political opponents viewed Long as a political upstart who they were getting ready to put in his place, in his place, right? Well, Long campaigned hard. He campaigned personal. Uh, while his opponents uh, were so sure uh, that they were uh, going to defeat Long badly that they left campaigning to others, to what we would call surrogates, replacements, right? They didn't have the time to go out and shake hands and kiss babies, right? They would leave that dirty work to others. Well, Long is out there shaking hands and kissing babies. Personally, um, he mails thousands of circulars, advertisements, uh, through the mail. He travels <laughs> everywhere in the state of Louisiana. And he became, not the first, but he, came, he became one of the first People, one of the first politicians to uh, make speeches on the radio because the radio was still a rather new technology. He attacked the big oil companies and he attacked Standard Oil Company specifically. So he, he was attacking big business generally and Standard Oil specifically. He said, if I'm elected governor, or when, and he was very positive thinking, right? when I'm elected governor, I will, I promise that I will give free textbooks to every school child in Louisiana. Whether it's a public school, or a private school, or a private parochial school, it won't matter. Now, why did he, why do you think he threw that last thing in there? He, he promised school books for public schools and private schools. And then he very specifically said parochial schools. And of course, a parochial school is a school that's sponsored by uh, a religion, a church. Why did he throw that in there? Well, it's very simple. Long was a smart cookie. Almost every town in Louisiana had a Catholic, a Roman Catholic school. And I'll go as far as to say that that is still the case, much the case even today. That was especially true in the areas of the state where most of the Cajuns lived, the Acadians lived, because most of them were a Roman Catholic and many of them sent their children to these parochial schools.
schools. So this was this was a bid for the Catholic voters of Acadiana. <coughs> Pardon me. He promised better schools. He promised modern roads and modern highways and free bridges, no toll bridges, free bridges. He promised uh, public help for our farmers. Uh, and he promised to make state government more efficient and more economical. Now, today, today in 2020, such promises are quite ordinary. Everybody makes those promises. But in 1924, his political opponents branded his platform as expensive and revolutionary. So it was basically a three-man race. The two opponents, the New Orleans guy, uh, the lieutenant governor, and Long. Long finished third, right? Uh, but it was close. Only 10,000 votes. He was only 10,000 votes behind the leader, and he was only 8,000 votes behind the number two guy. And in certain parts of the state, he ran number one. He ran number one in almost all of the North Louisiana parishes. And he ran number one in five of the Florida parishes. Now, what did those parishes have in common? A lot. I mean, a lot of poor whites, poor whites, um, uh, Long's message resonated with poor whites all over the state of Louisiana. Now, let's play what if. <laughs> it's always fun. Election day in 1924 was a dark and stormy and rainy day. Rainy weather across the state probably cost him uh, a lot of votes by people who were unable to get to the polls. Uh, remember that he is really appealing to the poor people. And who is it that don't have an automobile to ride in? It's the poor people. Uh, the middle class and the wealthy have automobiles. It doesn't really matter if it's raining or not for them. They can get to the polls and vote. So we think, we'll never know, but we think that that the weather on election day in 1924, uh, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to go as far as to say that it cost him the election, but I am willing to say that it would have probably made a difference. Okay, let's leave it at that. Uh, and as important as anything else, uh, because he finished so close to both the number one and number two men, uh, his political enemies now knew that he was a force in state politics that they had to recognize and reckon with. Now, almost as soon as the 1924 election was over, he began his 1928 campaign. Usually, politics, politicians will take a little time off, won't they? Right. Not long. Look, I'm... I'm it might not have been the next day, but it might as well have been the next day. He was back on the campaign trail. He knew. He knew that he had to do better in New Orleans. And he knew that he had to do better in Acadiana if he was ever to win statewide. And as a result, he, he worked very hard to establish a close working relationship with one of the important newspapers in New Orleans. It was the New Orleans States. I'm not sure. I think that letter became the state's item, but I'm not sure. So let's leave it right there. The states. Now, the states was not the largest newspaper in New Orleans. Uh, the old Picayune was. But the states was big enough. Uh, to where it had a respectable readership and he was going to be able to get his message to a respectable portion of the population of New Orleans. The big problem was the French Catholic uh, voters of Acadiana. He had, uh, he, he, he was operating under several 
really serious disadvantages. First of all, he couldn't speak a word of French. And back then, that was really important. He was not only, not only could he not speak French, he was a Protestant from North Louisiana. Uh, and he was viewed with suspicion <laughs> uh, because of the cultural differences between his home in North Louisiana and the people of Acadiana. He overcame that Acadiana problem. And he did it in a very straightforward way. There's, there was no trick to it. <laughs> When he was campaigning in the southern part of the state, in Acadiana, when he got up to make that speech, what one of the first things he said was, I'm from North Louisiana, and I'm a Protestant, and here I am in South Louisiana, in Acadiana, uh, speaking to a predominantly Roman Catholic uh, crowd, but he said, we have more in common than we know. He said poverty was a problem that was common to both regions and poverty transcended cultural differences, political differences, social differences. It's all about the money, he said. And uh, many people from North Louisiana and many people from Acadiana don't have it. Now, remember, uh, there's going to be a, the next gubernatorial election is going to be in 1928. But there were other elections in 1926. Um, and he made it a point uh, when he could to support Roman Catholic candidates in those elections. And not only did he support them, uh, not only did he just say the words, you know, I support them. But he actively campaigned for them and with them. So, the 1928 28 governor's election rolls around again, and once again, he has two main opponents. Uh, neither of them uh, were exciting candidates. They were drab. They were lifeless. They were colorless. It was... Oh, um, and then you got Huey Long, who is a ball of fire. He's only what got one speed, right? And that's wide open. And in 1928, there was no rain in Louisiana on Election Day. In the 1928 election, Long carries North Louisiana and the Florida parishes in a similar fashion to what he had accomplished in 1924. He had a strong showing, though, in Acadiana. Um, he did poorly in New Orleans again. When all the votes were counted, he had the most votes statewide. But he didn't win. Okay? In order to win, uh, a candidate needed a majority of the total votes cast. In other words, a candidate needed the majority. Now, here's a new word for some of you. Some of you know this, but some of you don't. So, uh, what he got was a plurality. What that means, a plurality is, what that means is he got the most votes of anybody. But that number was not a majority. It was still less than half. And so, what that means is um, uh, the top two vote getters had to have a runoff, and the person who won the most votes there would become the next governor of the state of Louisiana. Now, he was so far ahead of the second place finisher in the in that uh, first election that that opponent withdrew voluntarily withdrew from the race, and therefore, the uh, governorship goes to Huey Long. At the age of 34, 
he became the governor of the state of Louisiana. Uh, he had uh, run three political campaigns. Remember, he had run and won for the state uh, uh, railroad commission. He had run for and lost, but made a good showing uh, in the governor's race of 24, and now he wins the governorship in 1928. So let's talk about Huey Long as the governor of the state of Louisiana. He tried to make good on his campaign promises. He did. Uh, he was responsible for the creation of more and more paved roads. He did improve schools across Louisiana, and he did it for black and white children. He created an old age pension for the elderly that did not exist yet at the national level. Please remember that Social Security national social security program uh, would not be created by, it would be created by Franklin Roosevelt in 1935. Here it is, 1928. So seven years before Roosevelt does that long, uh, for all of the country, long does it for the state of Louisiana. Old age pensions for the elderly. He also does something that is so far ahead of its time that it's stunning, especially today. He does away with the poll tax. Now, remember the poll tax? Remember wh why the poll tax had been created? It was one of those tools that was used by the Bourbons to disempower blacks and poor whites. And it certainly did a great job. Remember we said that uh, coupled with the uh, content of the Constitution of 1898, uh, by the year 1900, most blacks in Louisiana couldn't vote at all. And the number of poor whites who could vote had been reduced by a quarter. Poll tax, along with these other techniques, like the grandfather clause and the literacy laws, uh, the poll tax had worked. If 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 you if your goal is to is to do away with your political opponents, it was it worked like a champ. But Long is from Wynn Parish, Louisiana. It is an area of the state that went strongly for the populists uh, around the turn of the century, and we've said that Wynn Parish was still a hotbed for political disagreement, for political dissent. The people of Wynn Parish had always opposed the powers that be, the elites of the Bourbon Democrats. And this is one example of just how deep that went with Huey Long. He said again, in 1934, as the governor of the state of Louisiana, he abolishes the poll tax. You no longer have to pay in order to vote, because that's really what the poll tax was all about. And as a result, uh, the numbers of registered voters in the state of Louisiana went up considerably among both whites and blacks, because remember, it was the poor whites and almost all of the blacks who had, mis had been disfranchised. And now that, that the main tool, the poll tax, was no longer there, uh, more and more blacks and poor whites uh, began to register to vote. Also, uh, probably his most obvious uh, monument is the state capitol in Baton Rouge. Um, that skyscraper that dominates the skyline of Baton Rouge, even today, was built uh, during the administration of Huey Long. Now, all those things are wonderful. There was a darker side to Huey Long because you... In order to tell the whole story of Huey Long, you've got to you've got to give the pluses and the minuses. So 
both talking about the minor sins. He purged many state boards and state commissions of old members who had been appointed by previous governors and replaced them with his own people. Now, that really shouldn't surprise us. That happens even today. I mean, why would you have, why would you want these boards to be full of people who oppose you? <laughs> why not uh, fill them with people who are, are on your side? Something else that he did, though, um, whenever he appointed someone to a political position, before they could get this up, before they could actually start doing the job, he required them to sign an undated letter of resignation. And what would that do? It would almost guarantee their loyalty, wouldn't it? Because if they did something that he didn't like, what would he do? He would just add a date to the resignation, make it public, and that guy was gone. He tried to, and very often uh, was able to control the Louisiana State Legislature. Uh, many of the people in the legislature were still uh, old line elite bourbon Democrats, and they had no time for a Huey Long. And so he uses a number of tools in order to whip those people into shape. For example, um, the governor of the state of Louisiana had the power of the veto. Um, the uh, both chambers of the state legislature, uh, the House of Representatives and the state Senate would create a bill, approve the bill, send the bill to the governor for his signature. If he signed it, it goes into law. If he doesn't, he vetoes it and it dies. Well, he threatened many of these political elites. He threatened to veto any bill that they supported when it got to his desk unless they went along with his programs. He would kill their programs if, if they didn't go along with his programs. He also denied patronage jobs. Now, what the heck is a patronage job? Well, it's simply giving a job to a relative of a big job, right? Uh, uh, a man, Mr. Smith, is a Louisiana state senator. Uh, and his son um, is still working, uh, trying to establish himself. And he needs a little financial help. So what do you do? You find a job for the boy to do. Uh, those and it's called patronage, and those patronage jobs normally had to be okayed by the governor. The governor long said uh, to these elite bourbons, uh, "If you want your children or your nieces and nephews or your brother-in-law to get any of these sweet patronage jobs, you're going to have to work with me to do it. Because otherwise, I am not going to permit it to happen." Also, if, if, the, if family members or friends of these old political bourbons already had a state job, they had it before long, ever becomes governor, he threatened uh, them with the loss of their state jobs if they didn't play ball. So by 1932, now remember he becomes governor in 1928. By 1932, four years. He controls the votes of two-thirds of the members of the state legislature. What that means is that he is in control of the legislature. He can get anything passed that he wants to get passed, and he can kill anything that he wants to get killed. Now, his enemies, and there were many, tried to impeach him. Tried to impeach him in 1929. Um... To successfully impeach Huey Long required, now remember, the Senate, the state Senate actually does the trial, okay? 
Now, there were 39 members in the Louisiana Senate, and in order to impeach, required 26 votes, 26 out of the 39. Two-thirds. Long encouraged, okay, encouraged 15 senators to agree to vote against impeachment, no matter what the evidence showed. And, of course, they agreed, and that was a guarantee that he would not be found guilty in the impeachment trial. Now, in 1930, uh, Long had been the governor of Louisiana only two years. And he decided to run for the United States Senate. Uh, the United States Senator at that time, from one of the two U.S. Senators from the state of Louisiana, uh, was a man whose name was Joseph Ramsdale, R-A-M-S-D-E-L-L. -L. Um, Long defeats Ramsdale uh, rather easily. But he does not go to Washington immediately. Um, he should have gone to Washington uh, within a couple of months after winning the Senate seat, uh, take the oath of office, and become a U.S. senator. But the rules are that you can't, you can only have one political office at a time. He was the governor, and he had been elected to the U.S. Senate but that doesn't make him a senator. It doesn't, he's, he doesn't become a senator until he takes the oath of office of a senator. And in order to do that, he's got to resign from the governorship of the state of Louisiana. Now, had he resigned from the governorship, that means that the lieutenant governor would have become governor. And the lieutenant governor was a man by the name of Paul Sear. C Y R. Uh, Long and Lieutenant Governor Seal Sear did not get along. They had quarreled, and so Long waited to take the office as a U.S. senator. In other words, he remained governor. Oh, excuse me. Uh, until the next election. <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> I do this a couple of times a day. <coughs> and there's nothing I can do to control it. And my allergies and my allergist says there's nothing wrong with me. Well, I beg to differ. Okay. In any case, let's try to get back to the thought without sneezing again. I'm probably going to have to interrupt it again. <coughs> like right then. <coughs> have y'all countered the sneezes? I've lost track. <coughs> Half of this video is going to be taken up and watching me sneeze. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I can... No, I feel another one. <coughs> He'd been elected in 28. Uh, it's now 1930. The next gubernatorial election is in 1932. <coughs> and so he decides to wait until 1932, so that he can help handpick the next governor of the state of Louisiana. And that handpicked replacement was a man by the name of Oscar Allen. His initials were OK. <coughs> OK, Allen. And that is exactly what happened. In 1932, now, from 1930 to 1932, Louisiana only had one senator in the U.S. Senate because Long chose not to take the oath of office as the U.S. Senator. But 1932 finally rolls around. 
Long's hand-picked successor, O.K. Allen, is in fact uh, elected governor of the state of Louisiana, which frees Earl, uh, sorry, sorry, that's his brother, which frees Huey Long uh, to resign the governorship and go to Washington and finally, two years late, take the oath of office as a United States senator. Now, just because Long is now He's no longer the governor. He's now a U.S. senator. That does not mean um, that he doesn't. No, let me say it this way. Long continues to dominate politics in Louisiana. He does it long distance from Washington, D.C. Okay, Allen. Oscar Allen was strictly a figurehead governor. Huey Long called the shots. Every shot from Washington. <laughs> whatever Long told uh, O.K. Allen to sign, he signed. And whatever Long uh, told O.K. Allen uh, to veto, O.K. Allen vetoed. It was just that simple. Long, now officially a U.S. Senator, uh, continued to act through O.K. Allen. He continued to build bridges. He continued to build highways. He continued to build schools. Um, he arranged for more free medical care for the poor. <laughs> LSU grew in size and in respect. Uh, Long, uh, while he was U.S. Senator, uh, created the LSU Medical School in New Orleans, which is one of the better medical schools in the country, even today. Now, let's continue to talk, though, about his dark side. He loved power. The more he had, the more he wanted. There was never, there was no such thing as enough power uh, in the opinion of Huey Long. He centralized his control of the government, of the Louisiana government. Uh, the legislature was still under his control um, and pretty much without question passed any bill that he wanted passed. Um, at his Order. I was going to say request, but it was it was never a request. It was always an order. And his order, the Louisiana State Legislature uh, redistricted Louisiana in such a way to favor long candidates and to damage long opponents, of which there were fewer and fewer and fewer. He would appear on the he would, he would fly in or drive in from Washington D.C. unannounced walk into the Capitol, walk into the legislative chamber, and take over the meetings. And he was heard to say, I am the Constitution in Louisiana. Now, Huey Long, in 1932, uh, supported the presidential candidacy of Franklin D. Roosevelt. Uh, but uh, that didn't last long. Franklin Roosevelt was, in fact, elected in 1932. But uh, Roosevelt quickly lost the support of Huey Long. Huey Long began to be critical of the New Deal programs that were created by Franklin Roosevelt uh, for the purpose of easing the effects of uh, the Great Depression. What Long said was that the New Deal programs favored business too much and the people not enough. He encouraged FDR to uh, redistrib redistribute the wealth. In other words, take money from the wealthy and give it to the poor. In fact, he started his own Share the Wealth program uh, in 1934. Why? 
Well, remember what I said about power? You said that there was no such thing as enough power for Huey Long. Uh, it was not enough to be a member of the State Railroad Commission, although most politicians would have considered that to be um, the high point of their career. Oh, no, no, no. He was not satisfied. He wanted to be the governor. <clears throat> and he, when he was unsuccessful the first time, he, he ran again until he got what he wanted. And then two years after being elected governor, he runs for the United States Senate from Louisiana. So, I suggest to you that it was the next political goal of Huey Pierce to Huey Pierce Long to become the president of the United States. And a lot of politicians, a lot of political historians would agree with me. That's not an original thought that I'm having. I'm fundamentally agreeing with them. He probably wanted to be president of the United States. FDR who had been very happy for Long's support in the election of 1932, uh, began to see Long not as a helper, but as a menace to the Democratic Party uh, and to the United States of America because uh, the Share the Wealth program, uh, that scared a lot of Americans to death because it was reminiscent of, on a good day, Socialism, and on a bad day, communism. So, Franklin Roosevelt began to, because he's the president, there are certain things that the president can do. FDR began to take steps to reduce Long's power in his home state of Louisiana. <laughs> For example, uh, there were important federal jobs uh, in Louisiana. Uh, and they were not to be filled by the governor, but by the president of the United States. And FDR began to give these important federal patronage jobs to Long's political enemies, not his friends. He went so far, FDR went so far as to have Huey Long's tax returns uh, audited to see if there were any irregularities. Yeah. Uh, tax evasion was a favorite tool used by the federal government to put bad boys in jail. Uh, think of the Chicago mobster uh, Al Capone. Now, Al Capone did a lot of bad things. He had people killed. Right? Uh, he was making illegal booze. He was doing all kinds of terrible things. But when Al Capone was finally sent to federal penitentiary, he was not sent there because he had, he was a murderer. He was not there sent there because he was a bootlegger. He was sent there because of tax evasion on his federal tax return. And FDR knew that. Now, from what I can gather, there were no irregularities. But that shows you that FDR was getting sort of skittish about uh, the potential influence of a man like Huey Long. Now, I mentioned a few moments ago that uh, while he was a U.S. Senator, uh, but still controlling Louisiana, uh, that Long uh, had the legislature redraw some of the uh, uh, political districts in the state of Louisiana. Uh, a special, oops, a special session was called in 1935 uh, to withdraw redraw, I'm sorry, redraw some of those election districts. And one of those districts affected a man uh, whose name was Judge Benjamin Pavey, P-A-V-Y. Now, Judge Pavey had been a political opponent of Long um, almost from the very beginning. He was from St. Landry Parish. And the way that Long wanted to withdraw, wanted to redraw that district would have almost guaranteed that Judge Pavey would be defeated the next time he ran for a re-election. So, keep that in mind. On September the 8th, 1935, um, 
Long was back in Baton Rouge, <clears throat> and he was standing in the hall near the governor's office in the Capitol building. When a man stepped out of the crowd and shot him in the stomach, in the belly, in the abdomen, with a small caliber handgun. Now, uh, Long had a number of bodyguards, mostly state troopers, by the way. And they immediately tackled the guy, do him. Uh, and they discovered that his name is Dr. Carl Weiss, W-E-I-S-S. And Dr. Carl Weiss is the son-in-law of Judge Paley. Um, Long is rushed to the hospital. Uh, emergency surgery is conducted. Uh, but the surgeon, uh, the, at, at first, the surgeons thought that they had saved uh, Long's life. That the emergency surgery uh, to sew up the damage uh, had been uh, successful. What they didn't realize was they had missed some bleeders in his abdomen. Um, and he began to lose blood internally. Uh, and it was too soon after that first surgery. Uh, it, a second surgery, if it took place too quickly, would almost guarantee, would almost kill him, guaranteed. And so they wanted to, they needed to wait until he gained at least a little bit of strength back before they could operate again. Uh, but he was too weak to undergo a second surgery too soon. Um, two days pass, and uh, he dies. He was 42 years old when he died. And according to credible witnesses, his last words were, God, don't let me die. I have so much to do. Well, Huey Long is gone. Now, what is Huey Long's legacy? Historians have argued over this for ever since... <laughs> ever since September of 1935. Uh, the state highway system he left behind was among the best in the nation. The LSU University system was among the best in the nation. He had greatly improved public schools for both white and black children. Uh, he was uh, responsible for state aid to the elderly and to the ill. Most of that had been accomplished not by taxing Louisiana's citizens, but by taxing business, especially big business. Now, blacks did not uh, receive equal treatment under Huey Long. Uh, but they were not excluded. In Louisiana, he got everything he wanted and destroyed everything he disliked. He crushed all who opposed him. In many ways, uh, however, uh, many people have tried to accuse him of being a dictator. And if you just look at the surface of it, you might be prone to agree. But no, I don't think he was a dictator. He was an heir. If you want to look at Louisiana history, he was an heir to the French and Spanish tradition of centralized executive control. Uh, in other words, of treating the people as if they are subjects rather than treating them as if they are citizens. He was not, as a result, the first powerful chief executive, but he was the first one to use his power to give the people what they wanted. He was also spreading his message across the nation when he died, and believe it or not, uh, it's been 85 years next month. Next month is September of 2020. Uh, believe it or not, his legacy still affects Louisiana today, 85 years after his death. Now, let's talk about Louisiana after Huey Long. 
xuống The years after the death of Hugh Long was appeared in Louisiana politics where contests or political contests were not between two political parties. The, the contests were not between the Republicans and the Democrats. Far from it. So if it wasn't between the Democrats and the uh, Republicans, what was it? Well, it was a contest between anti-Long people and pro-Long people. Some people desired to continue his control over the state of Louisiana, but they didn't have Huey Long's talent to do that. They tried. They proved unable to resist the corrupt deals and the state entered into periods of scandal. Now, remember, please, who's the governor of Louisiana uh, the day that Huey Long is assassinated? It's still O.K. Allen, right? His hand-picked successor. His yes man. Uh, okay, Allen had been a, a boyhood friend of Huey Long. They went back literally all their lives. Uh, and he continued many of Long's programs um, and continued to obey Long's instructions while Long was still alive, acting as the U.S. Senator in Washington, D.C. Long was not kind to O.K. Allen. Uh, he cursed Allen. He humiliated Allen in public. Uh, and Allen just very quietly took it. Uh, he permitted Long to continue trying to centralize uh, control of Louisiana government at all levels from the governor's mansion all the way down to the very bottom. After Long's death, okay, Allen and his followers scrambled to grab power, but none were really successful. None trusted the others. But in order to display a united front, they nominated a New Orleans judge to be governor and nominated Huey's brother Earl as the lieutenant governor. Um, and in the election of 1936, the Longites, okay, that's that's what they were referred to here in Louisiana, the Long, the Long faction, the Longites, uh, swept all statewide offices and three quarters of the legislative seats. So you can see, even dead, Huey Long was exerting a really important force in Louisiana politics. The new governor was a man by the name of Richard Lesh, L-E-C-H-E. -E. He was elected in 1936, um, and he was forced to resign in 1939. Now, let's talk about Lesh. Lesh got along well with the New Orleans political leaders and FDR's government, something that long was incapable of doing. In return for the support of Louisianians, uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, received tens of millions of dollars in federal funds, especially for the WPA. Uh, the WPA uh, was a program uh, called the Works Progress administration. And the WPA uh, was uh, uh, very successful in creating public buildings. Uh, if you walk around the southeastern campus uh, and go into the old building on the campus, um, E Hall, the music building, the old, old library, um, you'll see that many of those buildings were built uh, during the administration of Franklin Roosevelt, uh, and the money came through the WPA, the Works Progress Administration. Lesh uh, created a state sales tax 
or actually he, we had one already. It wasn't much. He increased, it'd be more accurate to say that he increased the state sales tax. Um, and for once, finally, uh, Louisiana had money to spend for social programs using money that was not raised from taxing big business. Uh, while Les was the governor, the teachers got a huge pay raise. Uh, he created tenure for teachers. He created a teacher's retirement system. Um, and he built another charity hospital in 1939. Now, sounds great, doesn't it? Well, there's a dark side to... Uh, Richard Lesh, Dick Lesh as well, because he had he was forced to resign because of the so-called Louisiana scandals. Lesh is widely regarded as one of the most, if not the most, corrupt governor in the entire state history. Um, he forced state employees to contribute 10% of their total salary uh, to a campaign fund. He permitted state legislators to simultaneously hold more than one uh, political office. Lesh got away with it for a couple of years, but he was toppled by an investigative reporter from the New Orleans State newspaper by the name of F. Edward Aber. And of course, we know how that's spelled in Louisiana H E B E R T. Led by F. Edward Aber, who, by the way, later became a long term uh, member of the United States House of Representatives from the state of Louisiana. Um, the state's newspaper uncovered many cases of graft, and fraud, and corruption in Louisiana, in Louisiana government, many, much of which could be tracked back specifically to Governor Lynch. Plus, there were other scandals during this same period of time that were not, that had nothing to do with Lynch, but which led to the impression that Louisiana was a really corrupt place. For example, uh, the president of LSU uh, stole half a million dollars in university funds and left the country. <laughs> uh, the building superintendent over at LSU demanded kickbacks from contractors and builders. In other words, I'll make sure that you get the contract, but you're going to have to pay me some money under the table. Lesh himself profited from some of these corrupt deals. Um, he permitted uh, oil to be sucked out of the ground in Louisiana and no records kept of it. Um, and as a result, he received about $90,000 a year to permit that to happen. He bought an old rundown hotel in New Orleans cheap. He leased it to the state as a dormitory space for nursing students. And he sold it $109,000 and put the profits in his pocket. He encouraged the mafia to expand into Louisiana and to bring with them slot machines and casinos and prostitution. Now, the state of Louisiana hesitated to investigate their own governor, but the federal government Oh, no reason not to investigate. Uh, and so the federal government, including the IRS, uh, proved that federal laws had been violated by Lesh and by his cronies, including mail fraud, and faced with indictments, Lesh resigned from the governorship in 1939, and Lieutenant Governor Earl Long, Huey's younger brother, then became governor 
of the state and served out Lesh's, the remainder of Lesh's term. Lesh's problems weren't over there. He, he was in fact indicted. He was tried. He was, fa- he was found guilty. He was sentenced to four years in a federal penitentiary. By the way, that LSU president, they caught him, and he went to jail too. Dozens of other state officials were also tried and convicted and jailed for similar crimes. All right. That is a good place to stop. And uh, we will pick up with the elections of 1940.